Yes, I understand that. So, dear friends and colleagues, it's a great pleasure to host the first panel today. And the panel shall deal with the question whether liberal Western democracy really is in crisis, and if so, uh, what we can do about it. If you look at uh, Ralf Dahrendorf's writings, speeches, and interviews, it's impressive to see with which topics he dealt already at a time when many social scientists didn't even know that these topics would become relevant in the future. Um, the crisis of democracy is for sure one of them. Dahrendorf's view of liberal democracy was marked by a kind of realistic skepticism. On the one hand, he was not prone to general alarmism. On the other hand, he did begin to speak early on and certainly influenced in a way by Colin Crouch about challenges to and crisis of democratic governance, and, but he never shared the naive hopes for triumph of democracy after 1989. However, as a defender of liberal democracy, as he considered himself, he did feel concern about the future of democracy. For him, the supposed crisis of democracy was primarily a crisis of democratic control, of rule of law, uh, and a crisis of democratic legitimacy, and not so much a crisis of participation as many people would frame it today. And I'm curious to hear whether our panelists today share this point of view or not. It's a great pleasure to welcome two panelists today who have written a lot of relevant pieces on this topic, on the topic of crisis of democracy in the past, and who, and who will, I am sure, have a lot to say on this here uh, at the panel as well. Unfortunately, Cornelia Kopecz cannot be with us today due to illness, but we found two wonderful high-class stand-ins. Our first panelist today is Daniel Sieblert. Daniel is Eaton Professor for the Science of Government at Harvard University and at the moment Fellow of the American Academy here in Berlin and of course, and even more important, Karl W. Deutsch Professor at the WZB. How Democracies Die, his co-authored book with uh, Stephen Levitsky from 2018, is already a modern classic. At, at least this is what my students are telling me and I guess they are right. Um, one of his current projects is about the revolt of the right and the crisis of democracy, and there couldn't be a better fit to this panel, I guess. Welcome, Daniel, and very, uh, thank you very much for being here with us today. <laughs> our second panelist is our local hero, Wolfgang Merkel, who kindly agreed to step in for Cornelia Kopecz. Wolfgang is Professor for Democracy and Democratization at Humboldt University and Director of the Democracy Research, Research Unit here at the WZB. He has also published major articles and books on the question whether democracy really is in crisis. And in 2015 and 2018, he published together with his unit here two books on democracy and crisis. And in 2015, the bottom line of the book was that democracy faces indeed severe uh, erosions, but is not in crisis. Um, and we are curious to hear whether this is still the bottom line at the end of the year 2019. So thank you very much for joining us, Wolfgang, and uh, we're looking forward for your talk uh, later. And last but not least, I'd like to welcome John Keane on this panel. John is professor of politics at Sydney University, director of the Sydney Democracy Network, and long-standing research professor at the WZB as well. John will also be a speaker on the next panel uh, on civil society, so he's a hardworking man today. Um, but he kindly agreed to step in last minute as a discussant to Daniel and Wolfgang. Thank you very much for this, John. You're simply the best. <laughs> now, each panelist um, has 25 minutes for the presentation. Then we have 10 minutes for the discussant. OK, John, 10 minutes for the discussant. Um, and then we will try to quickly open the discussion uh, to the audience. So please, Daniel, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. It's been a great uh, conference already, and I know coffee's waiting on the other end of this uh, session, but I hope this session will, will be worth it as well. Um, I, so I'm, I'm going to make some comments today drawing on, uh, I was about to say w new work with my uh, co-author co and colleague Steve Levitsky, but it's really new conversations, uh, kind of thinking about new, new issues. We've written a book together, but what I'm going to talk about today is uh, comes out of work and conversations and emails. He's in a different side of the world right now, but we've sort of maintained some kind of uh, collaboration. And so I'm going to comment a little bit on what some of the themes that I've been thinking about, that we've been thinking about together, that really very much fit with the themes of this panel. So there's really a consensus 
today in the West, as we've heard, that global democracy, if not dying, is at least in crisis or in, or in recession. Democratic backsliding seems to be rampant everywhere from Venezuela to Hungary to India. And suddenly, unexpectedly, in some of the world's oldest democracies, uh, there seem to be crisis as well. Now, this is all very worrying to be sure, but what I'm going to do in part today is to give you a more mixed picture. So the panicked sense of global democratic retreat, I think, is largely overstated. The number of democracies in the world has actually remained basically stable over the past decade. Now, there's certainly many high-profile cases of democratic uh, collapse. Uh, you can backslide, you can think of Venezuela, Turkey, Hungary, Thailand. But there have also been some significant cases of democratic advance in the last 10 years. Tunisia, Colombia, Myanmar, Sri Lanka, Georgia. Now, it's true the forward movers uh, get a lot less attention than the backsliders, and maybe for good reason. But the most important non-governmental organizations that measure these things, the Freedom House, an American organization, Varieties of Democracy, a Swedish organization, make clear that the actual number of democracies in the world has basically been a flat line for the last 10 years. So let me give you some numbers. According to these organizations, between 1970 and 2000, the number of democracies in the world tripled. Now, the 1990s was, of course, an exceptional period, comparable only to the huge spurt in the number of democracies after 1918. Uh, and in fact, in, after 1990, democracy emerged in a lot of places what, that social science theories would tell us democracy was very unlikely. So of course, social science has identified lots of conditions that are not necessary for democracy, but make it much more likely to emerge and to survive. These include a big middle class, low economic inequality, economic development, a functioning state. In the post-Cold War era, democracy emerged in a whole bunch of places where given these theories, one wouldn't have expected it. Now, it's not that these theories were wrong, it's that the international environment was so favorable, I would argue, after the, uh, 19, in the early 1990s, that the impact of things such as wealth, the size of the middle class, and so on, became less important. In part because Western powers were so dominant, and because they encouraged the adoption of democratic institutions, the cost of outright dictatorship increased dramatically. What's changed, however, um, is that the international environment is a lot less friendly for democracy today. Uh, the, the role of the United States and the European Union as global models, of course, has declined. Uh, the rise of China, the increasing interventionism of Russia has all ch have changed this as well. But what's actually remarkable is in contrast to the period after 1918, where there was a sharp d decrease in the number of democracies almost immediately, in the period since 1990, there's been a bit of a decline, but pretty much a stable pattern of democracies have been robust. 1995, Freedom House scored 76 countries in the world as democratic. A decade later, in 2005, it scored 89 democracies, countries as democratic. 2005 is often regarded as the kind of tipping point where a democratic recession began. What's remarkable is in the 14 years since uh, 2005, uh, when the peak year of democracies was 80, uh, the, the peak year was 89, today, as of last year, according to Freedom House, there was 86 democracies in the world. So that's a decline since 2005 of three countries, a net decline of three countries. So in global historical terms, we have to remember, and this is an important contextual point, is that the world has rarely been more democratic. So what this suggests, to my mind, is that the sky is not falling, at least not yet, but it's certainly darkening. In particular, I think, ironically, the area where there's been the most concerning development is actually in the rich, old democracies of the world. It's in old, established democracies in Europe and the United States where social science theory tells us we ought not be concerned about democracy because democracy's normally been a one-way street. But it's here where we've witnessed the rise of illiberal politicians and political parties, many of whom attack the basic norms and even the rules of liberal democracy. So this includes Le Pen in France, the Austrian Freedom Party, Salvini, the Brexit Party, Alternative for Germany, and Donald Trump in the United States. So what lies behind this? And that's what, that's what I want to focus on in my, in my comments. And of course, there are a lot of forces at work, but I want to kind of suggest a, a different way of thinking about this. The point that I would like to make is that one common root of the emergence of liberalism, illiberalism in advanced democracies is the fact that political establishments are weakening. Political establishments are weakening, which has opened the door for illiberal forces that threaten liberal democratic institutions. So this is a conference on Rolf Dahrendorf, and it's here where I owe a debt in my thinking to Dahrendorf. So let me step back from the specific argument and make a more general point. So one of Dahrendorf's 
uh, Greatest Works with Society and Democracy in Germany, published in 1967. At the end of that book on post-war development of democracy in Germany, he makes a highly provocative point from which I learned this basic insight. When it comes to politics, there's a difference between the intentions of actors on the one hand and the consequences on the other. Sometimes when political leaders, what political leaders intend to do generates outcomes that run exactly counter to their intentions. In particular, Dahrendorf argues that the murderous National Socialist regime, while intending at least in terms of ideology, to restore a traditional society, had the effect of destroying the remnants of Germany's old 19th century traditional order that had persisted into the 20th century. This, Darendorf, again very provocatively, argues ironically paved the way for the democratization of West Germany after 1945. Again, a difference between intentions and consequences. Today, I would submit that we are experiencing an analogous twist. I would like to argue that illiberal authoritarian forces and old democracies are on the rise precisely because our politics and advanced democracies, in a certain sense, are becoming more democratic, not less democratic. So let me elaborate. Now, as I said, we, we all know about the rise of illiberal parties and politicians. It's gotten a lot of attention, but the bulk of this attention has focused on the demand side, that is on why voters turn to these kinds of parties and politicians. So many scholars focus on economics and economic causes. They highlight the failure of established parties to protect unskilled workers from the effects of globalization, from disappearing jobs, from stagnating incomes, from rising inequality, especially in the wake of the 2008-2009 financial crisis. Other scholars point to the role of race and culture and how Americans and Europeans are responding to immigration and ethnic diversification. So Steve Levitsky and I make a version of this argument in our book, How Democracies Die, where we argue it's the reaction of a previously dominant white Christian majority to growing diversity and racial equality that's driving polarization and democratic norm erosion in the United States, a kind of sense of cultures under siege. Now, both of these factors matter a lot, but I think there's also an important supply side to the story. And that supply side is that its story is that it's much easier to be electorally successful illiberal authoritarian politician today than it was in the 1950s or 60s because political establishments are weakening across the globe. Now, what do I mean by political establishment? Political establishment, just as a shorthand here, is the network of organizations and actors that control the resources politicians need to get elected and to sustain a political career. So for the sake of simplicity, we can focus on three kinds of institutions. One is political parties, which are important because politicians, they control politicians' access to candidacies. Another is interest groups, business and labor and other interest groups, which are a critical source of finance and other campaign resources. And the third is major media outlets, such as television stations and newspapers, which are the principal means through which politicians gain access to voters. Now, political parties, interest groups, and media outlets obviously do not constitute a single monolithic block. There's considerable amount of pluralism and competition among them, but they do impose certain boundaries, both in terms of political style and policy substance. Politicians who exceed these boundaries, who violate certain behavioral norms, who push extremist policies, tend to be shunned by the establishment. Party leaders won't nominate them, union leaders won't back them, and media won't cover them, or if they do, very negatively. Now, half a century ago, this mattered a lot because political establishments maintained a monopoly over the resources politicians needed to get elected. In the 1950s, 60s, and early 70s, party leaders controlled the candidacies, the, the candidate selection process. There were no primaries in most democracies. Party uh, candidates were selected in smoke-filled back rooms. A small, relatively small number of interest groups provided the bulk of finance, business, labor unions. And a lim limited number of media outlets dominated the media scene. So television stations in the US, there are three of them. In Britain, I guess one, Germany, two. This meant that any politician who was serious about getting elected had to be on good terms with the establishment. Politicians needed the approval of, of political parties in order to run for office, in order to, gain, uh, to get a nomination, even to be a candidate. They needed the approval of interest groups in order to fund themselves. And they needed the approval of major media outlets so they could get decent coverage. Now, this dependence had a kind of constraining impact. It meant that politicians couldn't just respond to voters and their preferences. They also had to respond to these organized networks of interests. They had to strike a balance between appealing to voters on the one hand and appealing to what I'm calling the establishment on the other hand. 
This meant that basically only insiders or pro-establishment politicians could sustain or made it much easier to sustain a successful political career if you were pro-establishment. Now this, in a certain way, was not a particularly democratic arrangement, but it was stable. And it was 20th century Western democracy, a system in which political competition was real, but nevertheless constrained by politicians' dependence on the establishment. Politicians who challenged the establishment, who we today call populists, usually fail. And this is a monopoly that, in fact, ex existed across Western democracies, the United States, United Kingdom, France, Germany, Canada. But not anymore. Over the last several decades, establishments across the world have been losing their power over electoral resources. In many democracies, political parties have, have given up their monopoly over candidacies thanks to internal party democratization. In the US, primaries for selecting candidates were really introduced in a meaningful way in the early 1970s, so the smoke-filled rooms of the mid-20th century were opened up. In the UK, this has happened more recently, and even in Germany's Social Democratic Party, this year, just this week, for the first time, party members voted for the party leader directly in a kind of primary. The fact that this happened with the German Social Democratic Party is indicative of the scale of the change, because as we all know, the German Social Democratic Party was the subject of Robert Michel's 1911 book, The Iron Law of Oligarchy. So if this could happen in the German Social Democratic Party, this shows you that something serious is changing. This is, by the way, also interestingly, uh, this was proposed at the recent party congress in, for the CDU, the par, uh, it was voted down, the idea of introducing primaries, but this is still on the agenda, and I think this is a, a kind of fact that won't give way anytime soon. So in addition to parties, interest groups have also lost their monopoly over campaign finance, because candidates can now raise money um, online. So Bernie Sanders, people often forget this, Bernie Sanders, the outsider, raised as much money as Hillary Clinton, the consummate insider, in 2016. Interest groups also have declining power in Europe as well. So in Berlin last week, for any of you who are here, you may have been stuck in traffic as 10,000 farmers and 5,000 tractors descended onto Berlin as farmers protested new environmental regulations that they thought unfairly burdened German farmers. The remarkable thing about this protest is that like the Yellow Vest movement in France, it was not organized by the very much establishment organization of the Association of German Farmers, closely tied to the CDU. The German Bauerverband was part of the establishment. But this protest was not organized with, but actually circumventing this mainstream establishment interest group. So how exactly did they organize 8,000 tractors to descend, or 4,000 tractors, 8,000 farmers to descend on Berlin? Through social media groups. And so this points to the third big change. The emergence of social media has eroded the influence of established media. So today, Twitter, Facebook, and other social media allow groups to organize outside of mainstream channels and allow candidates to reach voters even if they are shunned by mainstream media. So uh, my co-author, Steve Levitsky, visited Brazil uh, back in 2018 at the beginning of that country's presidential election. He met with a group of business leaders, most of whom backed the established center-right candidate. And the mainstream uh, candidate, center-right candidate, was down in the polls, uh, but they weren't that worried because he was backed by a broad coalition. This candidate was brought by a broad coalition of, of mainstream parties, and given Brazilian election law, uh, was guaranteed uh, uh, an hour of free media time on television every night in the lead up to the election. Whereas the right wing candidate, Bolsonaro, had 10 seconds of television time in the lead up to the election. So nobody that Steve talked to talked about WhatsApp or YouTube. But Bolsonaro used WhatsApp or YouTube to bypass the TV networks entirely and he won the election. In Germany today, the alternative for Germany doesn't need mainstream media institutions. A reporter for a, a German written magazine, national magazine that I interviewed recently, told me that the alternative for German politicians don't really do interviews with them anymore. She told me they don't really need us anymore. The AFD has its own YouTube channel that it uses to communicate directly with voters. They also dominate social media. In the six months before the 2019 European parliamentary elections, a study that I recently saw analyzed 220 million Facebook interactions and found that 86% of all Facebook shares of German political news was were from Alternative for Germany uh, postings. The radical right, in other words, in Germany, totally dominates social media. Establishment parties were absent, at least from the European parliamentary elections. The, the outsider party can reach voters directly. 
So in some, what all of this means is that politicians don't need the establishment as much as they used to. They can raise money online, they can reach voters via Twitter and Facebook, they can hijack parties through primaries like Donald Trump did in the United States, or they can create their own parties as the Five Star Movement or the AFD has done. For politicians, this is liberating. Freed of their dependence on the establishment, politicians can respond directly to the most mobilized of voters without worrying about what the elite thinks. In fact, they can organize against the elite. And in the wake of the financial crisis, in the context of rising inequality and, and, in, and heightened racial and cultural resentment, there's a fair amount of public demand for such populist appeals. But there have always been these kinds of demands for these sorts of politicians. I mean, Eurobarometer World Values Survey data is pretty clear that public opinion, support of democracy, and so on is actually quite stable over the last 10, 15 years. This hasn't changed much. What's new is what's happening on the supply side. It's much easier to bypass the establishment and even oppose the establishment than it was 50 years ago. Now, this scenario in some ways is more democratic than the old one, but it can also leave us much more vulnerable to demagogues, many of whom go on to assault democratic institutions. So this is quite a paradox, of course. We have to remember Western elites used to hate democracy. I wrote a book in 2017 on this topic, to the conservative parties and the birth of democracy, and it's very clear looking in the 19th century that elites, economic and political elites, were terrified of democracy. They feared the great unwashed masses. Western elites didn't really accept democracy until the late 19th, early 20th centuries. What made democracy acceptable to them was in part, of course, the counter-majoritarian institutions, what we today call representative democracy. But the other thing that made modern democracy safe for elites was the power of political establishments, modern hierarchical party organizations, media, traditional media, and interest groups. 19th and 20th century establishments imposed powerful constraints on democratic competition, transforming what could have been highly majoritarian politics into more bounded elite centered competition. It engendered what we can think of as Schumpeterian democracy, a system of elite competition. 20th century democracy was in the sense profoundly Schumpeterian, and Schumpeterian democracy depended on a powerful political establishment. But those days may be coming to an end. The gatekeeping powers of the establishment have eroded. This change in some sense, as I said at the beginning, is profoundly democratizing. Parties and politicians can be responsive to particular po popular demands, but at the same time, it opens the door to get demagogues like Salvini, Bolsonaro, Bjorn Hooker, and Donald Trump, many of whom go on to assault liberal democratic institutions. So the increased porousness of the political establishment brings greater democracy, but it also leaves democratic institutions and democratic regimes themselves much more vulnerable. How democratic regimes will hold up in this new era is, of course, an open question. Thank you. So thank you very much, Daniel. And Wolfgang is next. And I'll put the slides on the... Yesterday night, I received uh, the email from Cornelia Kopech that she cannot come due to a massive flu. And I was briefly thinking, what should I do as a commentator of this panel? And then I decided I will present some of my humble thoughts. But after an additional five minutes, I thought, no, I will reread Ralph Darndorf's long conversation über die Krisen der Demokratie. And therefore, I started, uh, I will start my presentation with some of uh, the major points I filtered uh, out from this conversation with Ralf Darndorf. So uh, it will not be a polished version as Daniel has presented. It will be a collection of major points we certainly have to discuss in order to understand the position of Ralf Darndorf and to learn from that for the future of democracy. One reason, one reason, and this is an, a response to Sasha Knight, why I hesitate to talk about the crisis of democracy, is the following one. I think the singular is misleading. As a comparativist, I would immediately argue Finland is not Hungary, 
Sweden, not Poland, and Ukraine, certainly not the Netherlands or France. So the democracy is highly problematic. And the second question is, we have not solved major problems, what a crisis of democracy means. If we take the ancient Greek term of crisis, it means it is an ex existential question. It is a crossroads situation. It's a question of life and death. And if you look to Western Europe, it's very difficult to discover countries where we are in such a crossroad situation. So, uh, but this was just uh, the attempt briefly uh, to respond to Sasha Kneipp. When I read uh, uh, The Crisis of Democracy, Darndorf is using it as a title and sometimes he uses the term but he does not uh, really define it and at the end you got the impression he even does not think there is a crisis of democracy but there are unresolved challenges and challenges where we may not have the idea uh, how uh, to solve it. And the first point he uh, is responding to in his conversation is that democracy needs a political space. And this is probably one of the controversies we have today, which should be the space in a time where uh, political decisions or political problems cannot be solved anymore by a nation state alone. And I agree to that. But at the same moment, we know that supranational political spaces cannot be democratized as easily and as good as we are used uh, to see it in the nation states of Western Europe and even North America. So uh, Ralph Dandorf is arguing democracy faces a problem if we lose um, the political space and if we have a space which is not reachable by uh, the demos, by the citizens, because they cannot participate as they should participate in democracy, and it's very difficult to hold those who are in power uh, accountable. Uh, accountable. So there is a certain ambiguity in Ralph Dandorf, necessarily, I would add, in Ralph Dandorf's writings uh, on supranational regimes like the European Union, the United Nations, NATO, quite different supranational regimes. We need them to some extent, but we have to avoid that the transferal of democratic competences from the nation state to the supranational uh, regime will be paralleled by a loose of democratic contents. He is Im immediately clear, and this is important, and it is, uh, can be linked to the discussion we had before with Timothy Garden Ash, he argues a problem for democracy without ambiguity is that we have global players, global firms, which are have the power to circumvent, to circumvent traditional democratic decision making. And then I'm quite, in a, I, when I was rereading it, I was completely astonished that things we discuss now in 2017, 18, 19 were already to some extent written by uh, Ralph uh, Dahndorf. He's talking about the emergence of a cosmopolitan global class. Timothy was hinting at this fact uh, as well. And this global class uh, is in possession of the three C's. Concepts, they have concepts, they have competence, and they have 
connections. And the proper core of this cosmopolitan class, uh, he is saying, is probably 1% of our societies. But there are 20% of the citizens well educated living in metropolitan areas are about to imitate this cosmopolitan class. They have similar habits, similar consumption uh, habits, and a um, similar lifestyle. And this new global class uh, believes in meritocracy, at least what they think uh, meritocracy is. This is a, certainly a major discussion, and we heard about Twerkin. Twerkin would uh, be uh, very cautious to accept this understanding of meritocracy. They have an ecological consciousness. Uh, they believe the global and the local is beautiful but they have a deep distaste of the nation state. They think the nation state is anachronistic and they uh, tend to think about how to circumvent these traditional procedures and institutions of the democratic uh, uh, nation state. And they have to some extent the power, especially if we talk about this one uh, percent, and they have the power, and here I quote Ralph Dandorf, literally, they have the power to destroy traditional social solidarity of our societies, quote, end. So the global class, and this is again an idea and an argument of Ralph Dandorf, the global class does not need the lower classes anymore as the traditional capitalists needed the workers. They are living in quite different, uh, uh, different economic uh, circumstances. And if we take up these ideas of Dandorf and put it into the present time, then we can talk about a two-dimensional uh, space of political competition. Uh, still left and right, the redistributional conflict in our societies is alive. We have read so many essays that this is dead, this is not true, and by the way, to make some propaganda for uh, our department, this is what we always find out if we have surveys after and before the election. This shapes our political party, political preferences. But there is a cross-cutting cleavage one could call them, and Cornelia Kopic would have called it, a cultural cleavage. And here you see the two communities, and Timothy Gardner was talking about this as well. You have on the one side, at the pole of this conflict line, you have the cosmopolitans, those who are in favor for open borders, for goods, capital, services, but also for uh, workers, but also for, for borders which are open to give up nation state competences to a supranational level. And of course for asylum seekers and refugees. And down uh, on, this, on the other pole of this cleavage, you have what one could call, and we have called it in a common project with Ruit Koopmans and Michael Zern, communitarians. And these communitarians, they believe that there is an internal value of the political community. It is important because only in this limited space they believe they can establish a strong welfare state. And this is probably one of the failures of the European Union. They did not establish a firm, solid social uh, ground. They helped to dismantle uh, barriers for the free flow of capital. They were not a protection for these people against globalization. They were, so to say, the 
uh, European guard of uh, globalization. So these communitarians come in different, in two different clothes. The one are the classical social democrats. If you read what they have written in the 1930s, 40s, 50s, and 60s, this is an political community with a strong solidarity, with a strong welfare state. And if you want to find uh, such a model still in reality today, it's probably Denmark which comes closest to it. They close the borders against refugee, and I don't want to touch it now in normative terms, they closed it. Uh, at the same time, they have the most intensive uh, redistribution in their tax policies, in their social policies. And they uh, achieved one important fact. They were able to reduce the vote share of the right-wing populace from 22% down to 8%. And it happened in 2019. Again, I don't want to portray this as a model, but this is one version of this communitarianism. And the second one is the one we are always talking about. This is the chauvinist, the nationalist version. This is, uh, these are the parties we describe as right-wing populists. And probably we have to think about in divided societies that we find compromises, and you may even look at this uh, little graph where these ideal types for democratic citizens can be found. I uh, can come back to this uh, discussion. I have two more slides. Uh, the responses of Ralph Dandorf were the following. He's, he is explicitly stating the nation state is not dead. It depends very much on the policy field, in social policies, in education, in setting up infrastructure. The nation state is still powerful. It is still in place. It is not in place if it comes to monetary policy and very often even not in terms of fiscal policy, especially if we go to southern Europe or other countries at the European uh, rim. And he argues the core is the parliament and representative democracies have problems but they are the proper uh, system, the proper regime for the nation uh, states. However, uh, we cannot simply transfer these representative institutions from the nation state up to the supranational regime. And he's very keen on this problem. However, he uh, argues here we have to have a political fantasy uh, to democratize this supranational space. He's not outrightly uh, pessimistic about it, but he is arguing this will be much more difficult uh, than uh, democratizing, uh, democratizing nation states. And he adds that a problem will be in the future the sovereignty of the demos so that the demos can bring in his interests, ideas, passions, and morals. Uh, and uh, this is not solved in international organizations. And he adds also, and it's increasingly not solved in nation states as well. So. Uh, Michael Zürn would be certain, and his uh, team would be certainly somebody uh, who is more optimistic uh, to democratize these international organizations. And we have to find solution for it, because uh, putting back all the competencies back to the nation state, as Wolfgang Streeck is arguing, is probably an anachronistic approach as well. So, I come to my last uh, slides. 
This is how we understand uh, a democracy. Uh, Democracy is not only about free, general, and sometimes fair elections. I leave it to you what fair elections are. This is a major problem of definition. Certainly, uh, the, uh, are elections in democracies fair if you need at least five million to get a seat from your private property or you f have to find donors? in order to get a seat in the House of Representatives in the United States, not to talk about Italy under Berlusconi's uh, terms. So it has to be embedded in political rights and political uh, opportunities. And according to Rawls and others, they have to be equal. There is no argument not having these equal political rights and opportunities, and they have to be embedded in civil rights as well. Otherwise, they will not be used. We need uh, uh, checks and balances, and we need governments at least governments who try to govern. The sociologist Niklas Luhmann has argued this is anyway something utopian. Governments can only govern themselves. I don't share this point, and uh, uh, I think uh, they have spaces to uh, govern, but it depends very much on uh, the policy field. Here in the corner, you see four paradigmatically uh, four uh, major challenges which were not solved so far uh, in our democracies. This is uh, the kind of financialized capitalism. This is socioeconomic inequality, which has increased during the last three to four decades in almost all of the uh, OECD countries. And then there is the John Stuart Mill question, the Robert Dahl question, uh, uh, heterogeneity, cultural heterogeneity. Doesn't uh, mean that uh, there couldn't be good democracies, but it's much more difficult to govern uh, heterogeneous societies in terms of class and cultures, uh, especially religion and so forth, than to govern homogeneous uh, democracy. And the globalization and Europeanization we have already mentioned, uh, this is something which disempowered the nation states, and it's not an anonymous uh, force who has done it. It has been done, it was done by uh, the democratic governments of the OECD countries as well. So, and the last uh, point is the following one. Because these democracies have not solved these problems, we see the following deformations and problems uh, persisting problems or new problems of democracy. The elections have, to be, uh, uh, have become very selective in social terms, the lower classes. It's no longer a gender question empirically, it's a class question. The lower classes do not appear anymore in political participation. They even do not vote, the most easiest form of participation. And of course, they don't go to NGOs. They go, don't go to these nice civic associations, the political association. These are highly educated young people. That doesn't mean these uh, associations are very important and uh, uh, fruitful for democracy, but it does not solve uh, the social selectivity problem. And we have a polarization in our society. I don't have to talk about this polarization of discourses and of party competition as well. And especially if we look to Eastern Europe, we already see uh, which and in which way right-wing populists can transform liberal democracies in partly illiberal democracies. And as you probably know, it is Viktor Orban who does not do it secretly. He offensively argues this is the type of democracy which is fit for the 21st century. 
century. Majoritarianism is crowding out to some extent the consensual type of democracy we have established during the last three or four or even five decades. It means 50.1% is enough to govern through uh, and this is, so to say, the Trump solution to democracy. And there is a revenge to globalization. There is a revenge to, uh, forgive me this word, neoliberal Europeanization. Uh, and the re revenge can be called renationalization of our political culture and political competition. Thank you very much. Thank you, Wolfgang, for the presentation. And now we'll listen to John Keane and his comments. Uh, well, uh, herzlichen Dank, uh, Sasha, um, Lady Darendorf. I, I want to uh, thank you very much for coming and, and um, uh, presenting comments blind uh, at one o'clock in the morning, because that's what my body uh, tells me. Um, is a great pleasure uh, to be with uh, Daniel and uh, and Wolfgang. Daniel, for the first time, Wolfgang, um, uh, an old, uh, um, young old uh, friend. Um, I think that uh, what is striking about the two contributions, first of all, is their recognition that talk of crisis, an apocalyptic term, particularly when Christianity got its hands on the old Greek term, is not appropriate. And that I think it was Albert Hirschman who warned about uh, the dangers of fracassismo, um, the danger of thinking about democracy uh, in terms of everything becoming shit. Uh, and therefore, everything has to change. He thought it uh, a peculiarly Latin American uh, problem in thinking about democracy, but it has actually spread and it has been, uh, it has gripped, so to say, many intellectuals and journalists um, and organizations in the past decade. What is encouraging and refreshing is that both Daniel and uh, Wolfgang uh, raise objections to that. And here the point uh, would be that uh, democracy, like uh, other phenomena, uh, as a way of life, as a way of being, as a way of handling power, is structured by braided tempers, by multiple rhythms. Um, there are a lot of things that are going on, some of uh, which have been mentioned, that are um, novel. I think Daniel rightly emphasized that the breakup of political establishments um, is not simply a catastrophe because it, 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 it is, it's having enabling effects. And I would add to this lots of other trends that scholars have rather neglected in the last decade, sanctuary cities the importance of hashtag me too uh, initiatives. Um, many of these counter trends are to be found outside of Europe. I'm thinking for instance of the way that the South Korean parliament has recently um, passed a law about bullying in the workplace. It's a very significant part of a sort of redistributive politics against the old chai bowl, against um, uh, the oligarchs. Um, and I think that in this sense, both of your comments are very immensely helpful. Now, um, the tough uh, questions. I, 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 I will start with Wolfgang, uh, not for the first time on this topic of cosmopolitanism and territorial uh, uh, statehood. But um, Wolfgang seems to me to be rather caught uh, in a dilemma that uh, seems to me to be causing some anxiety intellectually and politically about um, how democracy as a set of ideals, a language, a spirit, a set of institutions, which is fundamentally about equalization of power, how it can be reimagined outside of territorial states. Much of the literature um, much of contemporary uh, vernacular thinking about democracy has it that the territorial state 
is the natural address of democracy. You know, we speak of Canadian democracy, we speak of South African democracy, and so on. It has Tellurian qualities. Uh, it has, it's geographically, territorially bounded. Um, the task of reimagining democracy, um, which Ralph Darendorf was certainly interested in, for instance, in his writings on world civil society. The task of reimagining is difficult, and I wondered if you would say more about that problem of how democracy needs to be redefined in order to take account of um, the functional requirements of of, of injecting the spirit of democracy into cross-border institutions. There is no doubt that that is going on, uh, but scholars typically don't pay much attention to, for example, the inclusion of an integrity unit within this new um, AIIB, this new Chinese-backed uh, uh, bank. There was a power struggle about whether it would have accountability mechanism in, in it. Um, and, and Beijing actually conceded ground under pressure from Canada and Australia and several other countries. Um, they weren't prepared to sign up to a bank and risk large quantities of capital unless uh, there was some internal public scrutiny with powers of subpoena, and the Chinese accepted this. In classical textbook uh, terms, uh, that kind of power conflict is not understandable as to do with democracy. I think it has everything to do with democracy if it's uh, about the problem of accountability of arbitrary power. But I would like, Wolfgang, for you to say more about um, your vision. It's relevant, obviously, for the European case, but globally it's relevant, uh, about reimagining democracy, um, breaking with that uh, territorial uh, mentality. Um, that perhaps is a question you'll dismiss as a cosmopolitan uh, question. Um, uh, 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 Daniel, I'm sorry that my questions are a little bit more fulsome for you, but you've traveled a long way and uh, it's a great pleasure to hear you speak. I have, um, I have uh, several questions for you. I want to ask you about the future of political parties um, historically, the birth of political parties at the, in the last quarter of the 18th century, in, for example, and around the House of Commons uh, in, uh, in Britain, led to a 19th century growth of parties, as you know, um, whose vibrance, whose energy, whose capacity to mobilize uh, popular support came because for, in no small measure, they offered uh, resources. The promise, the moral promise of one person, one vote, initially just for workers or skilled workers, eventually for women. Uh, they offered literacy, they had publishing houses, they produced pamphlets, books, newspapers. Um, Mikels and Ostrogorsky tell us that they um, offered jobs. They were welfare states. If your child, new child, a child was born, uh, there would be some subvention. If your grandparent passed away, they would offer um, uh, some small funds to bury them. Um, they were uh, states in the making. They were welfare states in the making. Uh, I wanted to ask, in your thoughts about the breakdown of political establishments in old democracies, such as Britain and the United States. Uh, what role do parties play in the future? Is there a, a role to play? In very blunt terms, what resources do parties offer that are analogous to those resources that were very much drivers of the formation of uh, multi-party uh, democracies and that um, had, of course, enormous uh, shaping effect on uh, the modern world. This is the first question. Um, I wanted, secondly, to uh, ask you um, a slightly impolite question about America. Um, I mean, I live in the China zone. Um, the whole of the political class in the Southern Hemisphere is talking about this. The question is, um, 
what is happening geopolitically to this um, American polity, which Gore Vidal uh, famously said, cannot be called in the United States an empire, but in other parts of the planet is. In the history of democracy, I have written about this, there have been three democratic empires. One was uh, classical Athens, um, uh, enormously powerful, uh, the center of a democratic world with maybe another hundred democracies, uh, was defeated militarily, as you know. Um, the second, much briefer, was uh, revolutionary and Napoleonic France. It spoke the language of uh, democracy, of the droit de l'homme et du citoyen, and so on, and it went um, uh, on uh, military campaigns to convert parts of Europe all the way to Russia to the French revolutionary ideals. It too was defeated militarily. The American empire is the first global empire. Um, it looks, here's the question, as though um, it's um, in retreat. Um, it's difficult to know uh, the history which is under our noses. I'm, we can't know what historians will say 50, now, uh, 50 years from now, but there are more than a few observers who think that number 45, I don't use his name anymore, uh, number 45 is kind of symptomatic of a panic attack uh, that the American empire is having about itself. And this is very bad news for democracy, is it not? I, this is uh, my question to you. To both of you, finally, have I? Uh, it's one o'clock in the morning uh, and I'm now awake. Uh, I wanted to ask you about what seems to me to be a theme that um, thinking with Ralph Dahrendorf and so to say against Ralph Dahrendorf, someone whom I love dearly, uh, had much contact with and who would welcome this kind of question, uh, very little has been said about the greening of democratic politics. It's arguably one of the very great trends um, of my lifetime, of our generation. Uh, you all know the symptoms. I want to ask you what sense you make of this. The, 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 the symptoms are not just new policies. Um, you know, carbon emissions, trading, um, etc. Uh, I think the changes are much more significant than um, name changes. Think of the way that uh, Social Democracy was a neologism, I think, probably um, born of this city uh, in the 1840s, or Christian democracy. This greening of democracy is very much more significant because it not only touches on questions about energy regimes and whether carbon-based energy regimes are so to say, um, contributing to a sort of degradation of um, our biosphere and, and all that. But arguably, the proliferation of many different initiatives from climate strikes um, through to the birth of green parties and a lot of um, uh, initiatives in between, Extinction Rebellion, um, citizen science projects and so on, all of this seems to me to be forcing a redefinition of democracy, is it not? Um, democracy, actually, uh, as I have understood it historically, is the most anthropocentric political form that humans have ever invented. Um, monarchy has restrictions um, on the use of uh, biomes. What could be more anthropocentric than the belief that people, the people, are entitled to govern themselves on earth as they wish and do whatever they like to uh, the biomes in which they dwell and upon which they depend. Um, could it be, here's the question, that something like a reimagining of democracy is going on in the sense that inside actually existing democracies of our generation, part of the counter trend, is the redefinition of democracy as um, the self-government of people who regard each other as equals, entitled to dignity, as well as the biomes um, in which they are structurally embedded.
Is this not something that's pretty significant that Ralph Darendorf could not have fully foreseen, but something that is of very fundamental importance? Um, I wonder what you both think about that. So, Herzlich and Dank, I think it's enough. Thank you very much, John. It's now 1.20, I guess, not 1 o'clock in the morning, but uh, that's okay. I would like to give you the opportunity to answer to John's, or one of John's questions, and Daniel, will you start? Very good questions. I'll, tr I'll try to wrap up all my answer, all the answers, all the, all your questions in one answer. Um, uh, no, I mean, I, but I both the, your question about so your first question about parties can essentially you know what what do parties offer today? Um, and I think the question your last question I think actually are, are related in a way because there's a way there, there's a way in which you know whether or not we're in a crisis there's certainly problems facing democracies. And one of the things that's difficult to understand is to what degree are these problems acute? Um, and my general take is that this is not an acute crisis, but these are problems that we work through and muddle through. And so I like your Hirschman point that we need to muddle through these problems. And you know, it's like a house that needs to be upgraded every once in a while and patch up the foundation. If this is true, then what we do with political parties, you can, you can change campaign finance rules, Part, you know, the social democrats and the Christian democrats can figure out how to master social media and sort of tinking around the edges, this might be enough. Um, and, and so I, I'm sympathetic to that, to that view in general, I would say. But I'm also though reminded of, I guess there's two things that, weigh, that run against that. One, uh, something that Timothy Garnash said, which is rather than simply trying to come up with solutions for problems of the past, one has to think about the future and think of new imaginative solutions about the future. Um, and so tinkering around the edges maybe is not enough. I mean, maybe that's just a kind of a rear guard action and just trying to uh, re kind of reinforce the establishment won't be enough. The, the thing that gives that kind of more nerve-wracking perspective weight, I think, is exactly the climate change issue. Because what I've often experienced is, especially young people asking me, well, you know, tinkering around the edges, but we don't have time for that. We need to figure out how to, you know, in the United States, you know, we can't even impeach a president. I mean, we can't do anything. It's a kind of stalemate system at this point where this is uh, occupying 100% of people's minds. And so there's no way of addressing real problems and problems that are in increasing importance and increasing urgency. And so the timeline of democracy is a very slow moving timeline and as you know, political scientists applaud the slow moving procedural elements of democracy and that's it's about negotiation, compromise, solving problems incrementally. That's everything that I applaud, but, but is that actually a, an appropriate solution for the scale and the, the acuteness of the problem now? And so I guess that's, that's what makes me think that the problems are more urgent. So those are the things that I, so that, th th those are the two sides of the debate. I'm not quite sure where I land. I mean, as, you know, I, my bias, I guess, is to, is to think that the patching up of things can happen, that this is, that, that the crisis of democracy is, is more like an earthquake that kind of comes and goes, and you just have to reinforce your house to survive the earthquake so that the next time an earthquake comes, you can survive it more effectively. Um, but. I guess at times I wonder, is that going to be enough? I try to answer only one question and the question uh, which you already have addressed, uh, Daniel. If one think about the state development in a metaphor of a building, then you have over the centuries first the creation of an Hobbesian uh, state guaranteeing peace and the absence of civil war. The second one was a liberal state of the rule of law. Then the third one was a democratic state. The fourth one probably not uh, completed as a democratic as well, uh, the uh, social welfare state. And the fifth one, your ecological uh, state. And they have to be combined. And uh, I do agree that many states are failing uh, on, uh, on these several floors. If we take up the ecological question, and I tested sometimes in discussions with my students on global warming, 
You have, the first point is you have to be very careful with the selection of your terms. If you say only uh, climate change is something which uh, makes students suspicious. I don't want to say uh, this is correct or non-correct. You have to you argue this is a climate catastrophe. And using the term catastrophe means what Daniel said, we don't have time. And if we are arguing we don't have time, then we are in a bad situation defending the democratic state. Democracy needs time because what we have argued and debated during the last two or three decades was deliberation, deliberation, and deliberation. Deliberation among the citizens should solve all the problems of representative democracy. And now, all of a sudden, we are being pushed in an empire of speed. So speed becomes the imperative of political action. But to have speed, uh, in uh, political procedures means you have to give up certain procedures. The first reading, the second reading, the third reading of um, laws in the parliament, and it's, uh, you are even not allowed to form compromises because compromise became now something pejorative in front of this gigantic problem of human mankind. And I'm using here the terms, which are to some extent problematic. And what I also discover in these discussion about the future of democracy is a somehow naive belief in science. And the sentence is simply, science has told us. <laughs> science has proven. We don't have time. Five minutes after 12. And these are, uh, this uh, is a use of words which is deeply undemocratic. Science deliver important knowledge into these uh, terrible causes of global warming, but they cannot give us any idea how to uh, find authoritatively binding decision for the whole society. These decisions uh, need legitimacy and uh, many of these well-educated young people are prepared to exchange uh, a democratic procedure for fast and effective, seemingly effective decision on a question which is simply defined, this is the political question. This is the question of human mankind. What can you say against such an argumentation? So, thank you very much. And now I would like to open the discussion uh, to the audience. And uh, the first person on my list is Michael Zürn. We have some microphones over there, so please wait for the, for the microphone. You don't have to introduce yourself. <laughs> I already did it, yeah. Thank you. Michael Zürn, my name, from the Global, Gover Global Governance Unit here. Uh, I have one observation. Uh, thanks, first of all, to those wonderful presentations and the wonderful comment. Very interesting. I have one observation about the two presentations, and uh, that is one that probably you should talk to each other, you should deliberate with each other, because if I got it right, Dan was arguing it is essentially the decline of control of the political establishment that is responsible for the thing that comes close to a crisis, while Wolfgang was arguing it's the running away of the political establishment from democratic control by using uh, supranational institutions in order uh, to, uh, to do politics. So that seems to me a sort of a contradiction and I just wanted to ask both of you whether you are able to integrate the story of the other one into your story, because at the moment they look a little bit contradictory to me. Um, and then I, my question is, I mean, it's also something with, with what I am struggling very much. I mean, if we come to all of those political explanations of the crisis, and given now that we talk about Dandorf, who was a sociologist and who was pointing to social changes. I mean, if, if I would take now your two things together and I would say, let's assume the consol consolidated democracies in Europe would be still controlled by the political establishment, 
the art in our years uh, in Germany, and it would be still a European Union which is not more than uh, uh, some so form of integrated market, the early 1960s. So if we would politically live in those early 1960s, but the social and cultural world would be our world today, do you believe we, won't, we wouldn't have a crisis? So, I mean, I'm just asking, do those political explanations really suffice, or do we not to need to endogenize somehow the social and cultural developments that took place? Thank you. I think we should take a second one, and the second question comes from Manfred Schmidt in the second row. The microphone is over there. Well, thank, thank you for the two wonderful presentations. I have a question on the transfer of sovereignty rights to supranational um, institutions. This transfer really creates a major problem for democracy at the level of the nation state, other things being equal. And here comes my question. Is it conceivable that the loss of democracy will be compensated through more democracy at the level of the supranational institution? And or is it conceivable that the loss of democracy will be countered by a dramatic increase, increase in, um, in sovereignty in the nation states through more participation, maybe through the I hesitate to say that, through the expansion of the welfare state, through the expansion of the public sector and other things. Would there be any way out or is the situation simply that we have to accept the fate of globalization and Europeanization that the uh, political systems of our times become less democratic than they were before? So I take the easy question and I leave the difficult ones to, to you, Daniel. Uh, I'm not completely uh, positive if I understood all the questions of uh, Michael, but uh, my argument is not that the nation state is in full control uh, of those who are in power. Uh, my argument is there are three core principles of democracy, and this is freedom, equality, and control, control of those who are in power. And my second following argument is uh, this can be more easily done in a nation state, and it is not fully established, and we are talking about these deformations of democracy or the non-completed democratization of democracy. But if I look then to the European Union, if I look to the World Trade Organization, if I look to NATO, if I look to these supranational regimes, there is at least the main, main, mainstream who is arguing, uh, and I think rightly arguing, that they are less democratic because uh, they cannot guarantee the same kind of participation of the citizens. They do not have the same transparency, which is even not sufficient in the nation state. Uh, they uh, cannot guarantee the checks and balances as you can do it in the traditional democratic nation state. And we have a famous ruling of the constitutional court, of the German constitutional court in the 1990s, the so-called so lange bis, uh, I cannot translate it, uh, maybe you can, so lange bis uh, judgment, meaning uh, the government and parliament are not legitimated to give up more na nation state competences to the European level as long as, so, so long it is, as long as these European, this European space is not sufficiently democratized. Uh, 
So I don't want to, want to bury myself behind the constitutional court, but this is a democratic principle. It may be the case that we are uh, coming to the decision we have to solve this problem. We cannot solve it at the nation state. Therefore, we have to do it on a supranational level. But we pay a price. Then we should be honest, we pay a price. It's less input democracy because we're expecting more ex, uh, uh, output democracy. So this is something we have to be honest. And it can be legitimated. But on a lower democratic space. And here the discussion begins, can we indeed legitimate it? Very po uh, short point to Manfred uh, Schmidt. Uh, this is exactly what I'm trying to say. Uh, if the loss of democratic control and on democratic quality on a nation sta a state, which is anyway a one level in a multi-level system of governance. This is what we have to say. Uh, uh, if we can democratize the supranational political spaces, there is not at all any problem of legitimacy, but if we cannot do it as a democratic, uh, somebody who is doing research on democracy, I am extremely skeptical and we have to say this means less democracy if we are not able. People like Fritz Scharf and others, they say this is uh, what supranational regimes can do and especially the European Union is negative integration, dismantling barrier, uh, barriers, uh, but they are extremely bad in establishing positive and pursuing positive integration, meaning uh, social policy, uh, how to include the uh, interests of, uh, of workers in Sweden and in Bulgaria and Romania. Extremely difficult. And how to find decisions in a club of 27 or 28 without this famous European identity. Therefore, I think it is a kind of democratic duty to be skeptical. That gave me time to have an answer, although I don't know if it's developed much further than my initial thoughts on this. I, mean, I think, I, I don't want to be misunderstood to kind of say that, yes, I don't want to be misunderstood that I'm nostalgic for the days of Konrad Adenauer and the political establishment of the 1950s and 1960s. If anything can disabuse you of that uh, nostalgia, um, look at the 1968 Democratic Convention in Chicago, uh, Democratic Party Convention in Chicago, where Mayor Daley, who was head of the political machine, was sitting in the audience, and you can f go find this on YouTube if you didn't experience this directly, but it was t televised live on national television where there were Democratic activists at the party convention Democratic Party activists, and this was the head of the party, they were being disruptive, and since he controlled the police, he sent in his, own, his city's police to go beat up the Democratic activists in his own Partei Tag. And so this was the, this is machine uh, politics without, uh, this is a, a strong establishment. And so it was in reaction to that that the Democratic Party democratized the way it selected its candidates. And so that was a good development. So I, again, I don't want to go back to that era, but I think the point, and there's really no cho there's no choice about going back to that era. But I th but what I'm trying to raise is a little bit of skepticism that that these are not always democratic when one's making these kinds of reforms. And so this reform proposal that was in front of the CDU to uh, proposed, I, I believe, by the Werte Union, or no, the Junge Union, but sort of backed by the Werte Union. I mean, this was a clear power. What they wanted to do is this is a power play. They want to come up with a new mechanism for selecting leaders so that they can sideline politicians who they think are too moderate. And so, as in all politics, you know, there's interests are at stake. And so, one has to just think about what the consequences of these reforms are. And so, that that's kind of my point. I mean, I think there's a way in which it's impossible to turn the clock back. But how does one create institutions that have 
that avoid the pitfalls of uh, Mayor Daley, but then also avoid the pitfalls of somebody like Donald Trump being able to take over the Republican Party. And so this, these are the details of party statutes and how candidates are selected. And this is you know, maybe small, boring politics, but it, it turns out to be incredibly important, I think. So I have three more people on the list, and if nobody else has one raised question, uh, question, then we should close the panel then. I have first Klaus Offer sitting over there. Yeah. Thanks. Um, this is a comment on Wolfgang Merkel's. I mean, I, I admire you for doing this in uh, 24 hours, uh, on 24 hours notice, right? Uh, you said you learned about this uh, yesterday evening. Okay, I think one of your key terms is it's still uh, on the uh, display, effective power to govern. And uh, uh, I think that is a very fruitful uh, category to explain what is problematic in uh, uh, the the, the life of uh, our democracies. Um, the, uh, this, uh, in, in the everyday experience of both uh, academics and non-academic ordinary citizens, uh, this power to govern seems to be, there are many indicators that I'm not going into here, seems to be highly defective. And uh, uh, no one knows how to restore it. Uh, and the two possibilities are to restore it by democratizing supranational agency, which is uh, highly unpromising, uh, as is the other one, namely uh, renationalization, which is a non starter from the beginning. And uh, this dilemma that you cannot, okay, the, the music plays somewhere else. Uh, supranational uh, agency is democratically inaccessible. We, the citizens, have no way to raise our voice or make ourselves under, understood. Therefore, uh, and that is the pathology that we have to deal with, and I would like to comment, we, after having lost uh, trust in state power, we turned to the second defining element of a state, namely state borders. We strengthen borders, build fences, um, literally and figuratively, uh, to keep unwanted things out, people, goods, national protectionism uh, is the response uh, to the uh, experienced failure of state power, the failure of states to get things, things done to solve problems that all of us recognize as pro problems. Many, many examples come to mind uh, to this. This is one uh, explanation for uh, a uh, hopeless but highly um, uh, passionate, hopeless but passionate uh, return to national uh, states or national borders uh, for national. The other is to give up on liberalism uh, and uh, to uh, uh, give up on rights, uh, illiberalization, you call it there. Uh, and that, uh, of course, means that an equally hopeless way out of the dilemma of weak, effective power, uh, you simply uh, silence uh, dissent, silence democratic processes, and uh, turn to the soft kinds of illiberal authoritarianism uh, that we see uh, coming up uh, everywhere. But uh, the, the bottom line uh, of this uh, 
argument or this question is how do you restore state power? How do you restore, at least at the national level, in a situation where embeddedness has uh, changed its direction? It used to be ca the case that the political economy was embedded in states. Now states are embedded in the supranational political economy. And in this situation, it is very hard to restore state power uh, and the capacity the, uh, to provide the evidence that the state is capable of getting things done, very simplistically speaking. How do you, do you see any way to restore state power? Thank you. Uh, Tanja Börzel. Yeah, thank you very much. I have a comment and a question. And it follows up on, my comment follows up on Klaus Offe. Um, Wolfgang, I think the European integration project has never been only about effective governance. I just want to remind you that European integration was set in motion to tame and constrain the nation state that was seen responsible for war and genocide in Europe. So, you know, in a way I think we glorify the nation state as the political space in which democracy can work. And I wonder, and that brings you, me to my question, whether broadening your perspective a little bit and look beyond the US and Europe, right, to other democracies and other, other nation states in this world, where the nation state is part of the problem for democracy and not part of the solution. So my question is to what extent your arguments, observations travel to countries such as Mexico, Brazil, Israel, Japan, India, maybe even Australia, although Australia, I think, would still fit the bill. So I guess I'm encouraging you to think a little bit beyond Europe and the US on the one hand, and also to look back in history on how the nexus between democracy and the nation state has evolved. Thank you. Final questions coming from the woman in the sixth row. I don't know your name, sorry. Yeah, that's, that's fine. Um, I'm Gabrielle Voidelko. I'm with the Kerber Foundation. Um, <clears throat> I thank you for the previous question because I would also like to ask about the more global level um, and come back to something that Timothy Garden S. Has, has said before about the connection between liberal democracy and economy. So <clears throat> we in our liberal societies, we live in a global competition and we compete with societies and other political systems that are extremely successful but clearly non-democratic. I'm talking about China and other, let's say, political models. And I was listening to you and, and the debate, I was asking myself what kind of answers do we liberal Democrats have to those who tell us that the, uh, the classical, our liberal democracy um, hinders progress because we are so slow, because we need to negotiate everything with everybody, and there are, more, so, there are other societies in the world who are economic, economically much more successful with whom we have to compete, as I said before. So what is our answer to those? people. Thank you. Thank you very much. Final round of answers. Who wants to start? I'll, I'll start with the last question. Um, you know, I think it's easy to misinterpret the messiness of democratic politics as dysfunction. And it's, th th there may be dysfunction, but it's also these are more transparent systems. I mean, I think of this as a kind of house in which the window shades are drawn open and all the neighbors can see all the fights that are going on. So it's, mis it's easy to misinterpret correction, self-correction as dysfunction. But you know, the, the promise of a democratic system is that it can be self-correcting. And so it's worth noting that when democracies do decline, it happens slowly because there's lots of efforts at self-correction underway. And I think there's actually a possibility and avenues for self-correction. Non-democratic systems aren't very transparent. And so we don't see the self-correction, and there may not be self-correction going on, and we don't, often don't know what's happening. Uh, it's like a family fighting with the windows closed, and so we can't see what's happening. Uh, and I think it's no accident that when non-democratic systems collapse, they tend to collapse rapidly. Um, you know, and so if we, we can think of the fall of the, the Soviet Union and the Eastern Bloc, you know, these regimes looked very strong until the moment 
what looked impossible became inevitable, and, and rapidly within a year, you know, all of these regimes collapsed. So I think there's a way in which uh, democracy contains um, these mechanisms of self-correction, and I, I guess my defense of democracy is, you know, to not misinterpret uh, self-correction for dysfunction. Gentlemen, um, about Klaus Offer's uh, questions uh, that seem to me to draw together uh, the conundrums um, in understanding democratic politics and, uh, and its location. Uh, without states, uh, democracy can't survive, territorial states. Uh, but we are aware, this was Daniel Bell um, more than a few decades ago pointing out, among others, that um, the territorial state is too small, too incapable of dealing with growing bundles of power matters um, that cross borders. And that seems to me to be uh, a proposition that will not go away. Um, but it is, I think, disabling of the democratic imagination. Because if, a, 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 whether it's VDEM or Freedom House, when democracy is defined, it's defined as national, and it's principally about the general election. Um, and that's, that definition is very cramping of uh, the democratic imaginary, because it becomes, it makes it impossible to think about democracy outside territorial states. And I think that um, here, I have uh, two uh, last points to make connected to this. I think going back to the 1940s discussion, which was the last great debate about the crisis and the future of democracy, uh, you will find um, this is the whole idea of monetary democracy that in that period, uh, when democracy was on its knees, th there was um, a general consensus from left to right that democracy here on, if it had a future, could not just be free and fair elections within territorial state settings, that it had uh, its spirit, the politics of democracy had to deal with the dangers of arbitrary power, and new institutions had to be built. And whether it was Karl Friedrich or Jacques Maritain, and so on. The idea was to build institutions with accountability mechanisms across borders. And in this respect, it seems to me that um, democratic theory and a lot of political science has let us down because a lot of things are happening um, across borders that are not simply describable as the removal of, of sovereignty, but actually um, are, so to say, however poor, embodiments of this 1940s spirit, this spirit of monetary democracy. I mention a few examples. Um, Cross-border parliaments, um, global publics, peer review panels inside institutions, um, networked cities, human rights networks, networked self-government of bodies like Amnesty. I mean, these these are all going on in our time, and I think, here's the, the point, that um, one needs a kind of Eleanor Ostrom understanding of democracy. You know, that democracy um, must be reimagined as polycentric, as, as multi-tiered, as interconnected. Uh, its quintessence is the refusal of arbitrary power, because arbitrary power, we know, is extremely dangerous and can produce catastrophes. And that seems to me to be one fruitful way of, of overcoming this, um, this uh, conundrum that I think Klaus very correctly uh, understood. And I have to say, as an outsider, that um, some of, the, some of the, the, the lines of thinking, not Timothy's of you, uh, about democracy and territory and states, seems to me to not not make sense of the tasks that the European uh, integration process is facing. I mean, it, largely the news has been bad in this session. <laughs>
you know, that it, it, reimagining democracy, more democracy in the EU, it, it becomes unthinkable. I mean, I'm just trying to stir up trouble because it's two o'clock in the morning. Thank you very much. Very briefly, first to Tanya, Tanya Perzel. I'm not glorifying the nation state. I'm very conscious about the fact that nationalism caused massive bloodshed in the 20th century. And we all know uh, that at the beginning there, were, there was especially the motive to lock in Germany into a community of civilized nations, which was uh, extremely important. Uh, and looking beyond the OECD countries, I, I deliberately focused on OECD countries. Uh, this was my task. Uh, and in a way, we do not find very many uh, democracies outside uh, the OECD world. Probably uh, these are a dozen. Maybe, if you, if you call such highly defective democracies, such as India, democracies. India is a brutal society. If it comes to gender relations, some of the autocratic regimes, and this is not a pledge, but some of the autocratic regimes are much better in keeping humanitarian values as many democracies. And if we talk about wars, uh, this is even worse, because democracies are sometimes more belligerent than autocratic uh, regimes. So I don't think there is a big uh, dissent, but the dissent may be the following one, and it may be boring that I repeat it. This is Dahl's, Robert Dahl's argument of the transformation of democracy. The larger the political space, the more complicated it will be uh, to establish democracy. And he has even a historical sequence arguing the city-state allowed for direct democracy by the citizen in ancient Greek. And then the nation-state came along and it was associated with a loss of democracy. And then he goes on in arguing, now we are living in times of globalization and this is the second or third loss of democracy. And as long as I have not seen, I don't mean the empirical case, I have even not seen on theory and uh, a concept of democracy which allows the same quality of democracy in transnational spaces as in nation states. I have the democratic argument, and this is only a democratic argument, saying uh, that the nation state on the average, with all the problems they have, are more and more easily to democratize. And I even said, we have to discuss whether we sh have to give up, in certain circumstances, input democracies in order to solve problems. This is a large uh, uh, debate on democracy, and therefore I'm, I'm not completely uh, bound, uh, certainly, to uh, the uh, nation state. One could paraphrase what, paraphrase what uh, Winston Churchill said once to democracy, so nation state is the most, it's the worst sort of democracy, except all those others we tried from time to time. So I'm open to be convinced, but and I know something of the literature, and, uh, and I have this discussion and learning from it with Michael Zürn, but I have not seen it. I, this is a long, long uh, discussion, Klaus, about, uh, uh, about this uh, effective power to govern, and there is a loss of this. However, there are spaces, and Ralf Dahndorf, and I, I read it last night, therefore I have it still in my mind, uh, uh, 
uh, he uh, said uh, there are spaces in certain policies, and I mentioned them. I repeated Ralph Dandorf, uh mentioned education. What we are doing with education is ridiculous for such a rich country in social, in terms of social justice, and in other terms. And what we could do in social policy as well, having a two-class health system, for example. There is space for the nation state uh, to, uh, to improve the quality, the democratic quality and the quality of social justice in our societies. Last point to this highly uh, disputed uh, example of Denmark. Denmark, if you look at the last 10 years, what uh, Daniel was starting with these observations of the democratic countries, the quality of uh, democracy, it's the country which was mostly on the first, the first, not only the first five, the first position of the ranking in terms of quality of democracy. Denmark is certainly, second point, is certainly a country where you have the highest redistribution beyond the market. Certainly something some people do not like. Uh, I have a certain uh, social uh, preference for it. Denmark has, in terms of social cohesiveness, uh, a better situation than Canada or the United States or other countries. They pay a price, and this is what we have to discuss. They pay a price, they close the borders more rigidly as many of the or as Austria, Sweden, and Germany, let's put it this way, uh, France is closing the border in a uh, same rigid way. So this is a price, uh, but they try to compensate it in foreign policies. If I remember well what Timoth Timothy Garden Ash was saying, uh, the problem cannot be solved by simply open the, uh, the borders, it has to be solved by supporting these societies abroad, but more massively. And Denmark is one of the country who does it much better than Austria and much better uh, than uh, Germany. There is a price and we have to discuss and democracy is not all beautiful uh, and it, it involves ethical problems and we have to discuss it, but we cannot simply say these are racist, they are closing the borders. Uh, it's not, no, it's not what you said, but this is what I heard from my friends from the top of the Social Democratic Party here in Germany. So thank you very much for this lively and interesting debate. Um, I think we all need a coffee now and I would say we meet again at 4.30 in 20 minutes. So... Nee, wir sind dann in der Zeit.